Well, I'd like to uh, thank you all for joining us today, the panelists and the attendees. My name is Christina Mayernick, and I'm Vice President of Plex Cyber. Um, we are a, a nationally, national security associate the National Security Agency accredited penetration testing company. Um, and we are um, all over the country uh, located in terms of our, our personnel as well as our uh, clients. Um, and I'm representing the Cyber Association of Maryland today. I'm one of their board members and I've been working with Mike and Andrew and Sam on pulling the, the symposium together. We have a great discussion ahead of us um, talking about one of the most critical aspects of cybersecurity today, which is the, um, the difficulty in filling open cybersecurity careers and positions throughout the United States and the world. About 50% of the cyber positions are currently going under, unfilled and it's causing a tremendous impact to the security of our, our country um, and our economy. So we're talking about that, about, about that today with three of our panelists. Um, we have Andrew Balmos, Kyle Wagner, and Adam uh, Zinchak from um, Point3. Um, I'll give each a, a, just a quick introduction and then we'll get into uh, the discussion. That sounds good. Um, Andrew? Uh, is a data software and engineer at Purdue University College of Agriculture. He's also co-owner of the Q Lever. Is that correct, Andrew? Uh, clever. So clever, oh, we don't know how to say it. Very, very <laughs> good. <laughs> clever company, an ag-focused software startup, and a PhD student in the Open Ag Technology and Systems Center at Purdue, which is otherwise known as OATS. Andrew spends most of his days working on sensor developments, wireless systems, data processing, and software across various university and private projects. So thank you, Andrew, for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. Great. We also have Kyle Wagner. Um, Kyle is a director of information security for Purdue Farms, an international billion dollar premier protein and food service company. Uh, prior to Purdue, Kyle was a business information security officer for Altria, a Fortune 200 consumer goods company, where he oversaw security strategy, risk and operations for domestic and international operations in Asia and the Middle East. Um, he's a Johns Hopkins University grad uh, with an MS in information systems and a BS in information systems from Salisbury University, which is right around the back, your back door now, Kyle. Yeah. Uh, you didn't move Thank from you. far. <laughs> yeah, it's a long uh, and your background there is where I spent the rest of my time in that Lake Mason building at the Johns Hopkins Business School. So oh, I love your background. Me? Yeah. I actually can see it right across the water from me. Um, so thank you, Kyle, for joining us and, and certainly so excited to hear more about um, Purdue since it's such a large employer here in the state of Maryland in the Mid-Atlantic region. Absolutely. Glad to be here today. Thank you. And then we have Adam. Um, Adam, pronounce your last name for me. It's, it's Zinchok. Zinchok, okay. Um, and you are Point3 Securities um, Senior Sales Engineer. Adam served in the US military, starting his career in the Navy as a network operations analyst and operator. Um, and using his 10 years of operational experience, he's developed practical training content for the Department of Defense and federal law enforcement agencies. Adam has worked with Point3 to develop a talent screening service to help address the talent hiring issue employers face. And I love seeing Point3 growing so fast. It's a, it's a much needed solution that we're all, we're all looking for, both from industry, academia, and also um, from a nonprofit point of view. So thanks to all the good work that you're doing. Thank you very much. It's been a, it's been a wild ride in 2020, but uh, it's been a great way to see uh, how resilient everybody can be. It's amazing, isn't it? That we're all here 10 months later. <laughs> um, so I wanted to talk, just to give a quick overview and then we'll go into the Q&A. Um, so we did hear yesterday in our plenary sessions, workforce come up almost by each one of the, of the speakers. Um, and that you know, one of the major threats is really having that, that lack of qualified cyber, cybersecurity workforce to protect our nation's infrastructure. So today we'll be talking about the global state of cybersecurity workforce and hopefully some practical solutions in 
combating that and finding a way of, of growing that workforce uh, in order to protect our nation's critical infrastructure. Um, so I'm gonna ask Kyle, um, since he is, is uh, acting in, in a senior, sen senior um, information security position, talk about ag and food uh, from the perspective of Purdue, because Purdue has such a large complex infrastructure, um, e-commerce, farming, manufacturing, massive supply chain, um, massive vendor ecosystem. Um, and once you've given us an overview, can you talk a bit about the workforce that you need on a daily basis to secure Purdue and its critical assets? Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for having me today and certainly enjoyed this topic is something near and dear to me and, and what we're doing here at Purdue is, as you mentioned, Purdue is really a multi-billion dollar organization that's coast to coast and has international aspects to it. And it's more than just the agriculture and the food. We've made a half dozen acquisitions over the last year and a half. We're not just chicken. We have beef. We have pork. We have uh, grain and exports. We also have new avenues, so not just wholesale, but now direct to consumers, which was timely for what happened in 2020 with our e-commerce. We're also into pet foods as well. So the opportunities are expanding for us. And then really what that looks like in security is that I'm trying to keep up with the business and how do I partner with them in protecting our infrastructure as well as our data, the privacy regulations that we're under, consumer data, and, and also CFATS which is the government's um, oversight around how we protect uh, equipment and facilities around chemicals and things that we might have in our processing plants. So, you know, it's a very dynamic business and our risk profile is not just straight manufacturing or retail, but kind of this mix. And so when we look at what I need to do in staffing and forward looking uh, security roles, you know, the things that we're discussing today, but even broader in third party and supply chain, because uh, just in the news last week or the week before was a Miracle cold storage supplier. A lot of grocery products go through that channel, also mm -hmm. a possible channel for COVID-19 vaccines, and they were disrupted. And their disruption is, is disrupting other organizations. So uh, how does a cyber attack in that supply chain go upstream and affect the ones that are dependent on them? And so it's this conversation is very timely for us and glad to be here and, and share more about what Purdue does. We just celebrated 100 years in 19, you know, starting in 1920 into 2020 and expecting to be another 100 years. And what we started out as, as selling eggs to now being a multi-billion dollar company, it's hard to tell where we'll be in 100 years, but I know cybersecurity is important to maintaining that mission. Well, thank you, Kyle. It's, I had no idea that you were in that. Purdue is involved in some, such a diverse offering of food products, including pet food. How many facilities do you have around the world? We have at least 123 locations within the U.S. And how difficult is it, is it from you uh, in your role, you know, ensuring the security of those assets and then also allowing for business enablement? Yeah, so, I mean, it's... it's just to make sure I understand the question, so how, how is it important for us in securing those locations? Because typically we're very corporate focused, like what is, where is our data center, where are the majority of our people? But we also know that there's actually more uh, going on down and away from the corporate office, from outside the administration. And we have those plants, feed mills, uh, grain silos. We have infrastructure that is supporting the operations and what I'm seeing in the business is that there's more automation and more technology to provide value. And to do that, they have to be connected to the internet. They have to be able to get data. They're hooking to cloud systems. And for me, that's saying, hey, I need to be there and looking at how we're providing security for this because this is a new concern, a risk. It's always been there, but now it's even more important for our focus. So getting beyond protecting what's what I say is the four walls, protecting the things outside our organization or outside the normal data center. And so this is a strategy for us to get, get a hold of. So speaking to the workforce issue, you know, you have your corporate infrastructure and your corporate the four wall network, right? And data centers. And then you have those deployed assets. Um, and so you have two unique requirements. You have I, traditional IT, and then you have IoT and OT. Absolutely. How are you, what is, how difficult is it for you as uh, a large food 
in, a producer, an agricultural company, to fill those positions? And 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 what type of skills are you looking for? Yeah, well, so of the other folks. Yeah, and so if someone else wants to jump in and tackle this, feel free to jump in. I can tell you. For me, we're looking at, uh, and, and security specifically, backfilling current positions, so the traditional roles, the analysts and engineering roles, to forward filling future roles that we need to maintain this growth, uh, from architecture to uh, engineers and data to IoT specific cybersecurity skill sets, so even more specific than what we have before in these journalist IT security or IT roles. And I think is a challenge for me that I haven't solved. And this panel discussion today is, is great to have that conversation of what our approaches are to helping to figure out how to solve for that. Because there's a, there's a double-edged sword. There's, you know, it's the recruitment piece of it, right? There's the internal development piece and it's you know that consistent pipeline that you're going to need as you continue to grow, as you've shown even the past couple of years how explosive your your growth has been. Um, it, 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 it's it's a tough issue to face. So I'm gonna I'm gonna jump to and um, Andrew. Um, so from your perspective, Andrew, from a university point of view um, and your current PhD candidate, um, from a, an academic point of view, what is one of your, or talk to us about what you see as a solution to filling the global workforce issue. Yeah, so <clears throat> I'll take a different perspective. I, um, I'm a PhD student for more years than you'll be willing that I'd be willing to share with anyone here. And part of that is because I've, I've been a full-time staff member for most of that time. And so before my current role, I actually taught in electrical and computer engineer, uh, in engineering. I taught our seniors and our senior design capstone course. And I, I have, I'm also out in the middle of Indiana. So my internet is awful. <laughs> so I hope you can hear me. Uh, can hear you. So uh, yeah, I, I don't know uh, if, um, I think Aaron All, also from Oates, one of my colleagues, uh, joked about uh, broadband, rural broadband. Like, it definitely needs to be part of the conversation because uh, certainly out here in rural, we don't have good internet. But um, I think uh, uh, well, I used to teach senior design students, and uh, I would see them year after year uh, go to our our sort of uh, industry event where, where companies come to recruit, and they would all line up to like some Microsoft and and all the big electrical engineering kind of companies. And here we are, we have uh, companies like Case New Holland and a lot of in climate and some of these ag focused companies, which actually have maybe more interesting problems to solve right now because they're just starting to solve them in a large way. You, you, you can go there and make a, a much bigger impact. They don't even know to go stand in the line. Uh, and so I think a big part of you know, cybersecurity, it's not just an ag thing, it, it's, it, it, it crosses a lot of industries. You know, a lot of the problems we see here are not unique to ag is starts early on in the education phase where we teach them, hey, just because you're an electrical engineer doesn't mean you have to go work for a company that produces circuits. Or just because you're a software engineer doesn't mean you have to go work for a programming company. All these other companies need these talents too. And uh, so I think, you know, that combined, you know, figuring out that recruiting problem where we can sort of get the students to the right people earlier on is important. And also uh, building into the curriculum, you know, cybersecurity is not a, a one stop thing, it's a stack. Right, you have to. You froze, Andrew. And I think as an institution, we teach uh, students uh, that um, information, or at least a, you know a, a breadth kind of knowledge of what does cybersecurity mean at all those levels, so mm -hmm. that we can build products from the beginning. Uh, you know, with that in mind, instead of trying to come back at the very end and, and, and say, okay, how do we hack security onto this now? Mm -hmm. um, so as a professor, I mean, were you able to, or, or have, or do you um, communicate to your students the plethora of opportunity that's out there right now across the industry, um, both, because there is just a, so many opportunities to, you know, to fill positions in, in so many different industries, not just, you know, finance or as you're talking right. about ag or um, is, so, is there an opportunity to talk to them about that? 
Sure, and that, and that's like one of the one of the roles of the course. I'm, I now don't teach it anymore, but that I used to teach um, would be to to try to introduce some of those ideas and, and and different avenues. But here's the thing: when you're in a university for four years, and a lot of you might be familiar with this, by the time you get to the fourth year, you've learned that that faculty and staff at the university. Uh, they're different. They're not industry, right? And you start to not trust them anymore. <laughs> they, they teach you the theory all day long, but you've already decided that they're kind of uh, out of touch in the marketplace. Yeah. And so what's a lot more effective is these companies coming in, giving talks. Uh, and, and it's, it's amazing sometimes some of these companies will come in and if they, if they come in with the right sales pitch, they can fill lecture halls with students just wanting to hear what they have to say. So I think it's uh, something that the industry needs to be more active about. There are some companies that are really good at it, other companies that, that probably should be better at it. And getting into these universities and, 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 and hosting the events and, and spreading that information themselves, like come and make the case. Why, you're an electrical engineer, why would you wanna come work for us? Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of these students really respond to the idea that it's like, you can make a name for yourself because we're just starting to figure it out. And you can be the leader in this area for this company pretty soon because you're not fighting a, a sea of thousands of engineers that came years before you, you know, already in the company. Right. So I think it's important, yeah. Thank you, Andrew. Adam, love to hear your thoughts on, uh, on um, really about solutions to fill in the global workforce deficit. Sure, so uh, first, Andrew, he hit it right on the head, I think from, from my perspective, um, I think a lot of it right now is a marketing issue. Um, <laughs> You know, those employers, they, they have to put their name out there and say, you know, they're not just, you know, Kyle can say, hey, they're not just a chicken company. They make beef, they make pork, they do all kinds of great things, but they also need so much more to make that happen. Um, when, when I was instructing in the military, the first thing we, we would do when we would get um, a new client, you know, we would roll out these new teams that just exist in, in the Navy and it would be joint forces. And then we would have to go to a command that wasn't cyber focused, but they have cyber. So it, it was always, um, you have to be able to identify that type of weakness. Uh, what is the, the, the terrain of the battlefield when it comes to cyber? And that's going to be a different terrain with every customer. So every employer, everybody that you ever run into, it's always going to be a little bit different. And, and just reading some of the stuff that, that I've, I've had a chance to see over the last day or so with, with this group, um, I had no idea how large and, and how vast the, the industry can be when it comes to agriculture. It looks almost like a new platform that we need to concern ourselves with, just like we have with automation in um, the power industry or, or other industrial con mm -hmm. control devices. You know, this is probably our country. Uniquely, one of our greatest assets is our, our food resource and, and that ability to produce these things. So I would look at this as just as important as uh, power and other industrial controls. So I didn't know about it until yesterday. So I, I think that absolutely uh, being able to get young um, professionals, you know, just coming out of higher education, uh, coming out of apprenticeship schools and being able to, um, you know, foster that growth internally. Um, what we've been seeing a lot of success with right now with um, just engaging customers at point three, it's been larger teams um, that have uh, slowly been growing internally. They're young technicians, and then they get to learn, you know, how the company as a whole will grow and how they can adapt to it. Um, they go to university, they go to higher education, they continue studies. All of these things are, are just proponents for them to learn how to identify and solve problems. Um, that's the same kind of thing that needs to happen, I think, at the employer level is, look, these are all the problems that we have right now, you know, announce it to everybody and people will come. Mm -hmm. um, I, I have a couple of engineering friends right now. Um, we all grew up in rural Pennsylvania. And um, my, my one friend works at a dog food company, and he's an electrical engineer. And, and um, I said, well, what are you going to do as, as a dog food factory? He's like, dude, it's, it's all engineering. It's always problems and it's new every day. And so it looks like cybersecurity is going to be another one of those things that um, as soon as a new industry happens or as soon as everyone starts adopting these new technologies and these new techniques, we're going to have to expand with it. So it could be 
you know, I'm looking at the ISC squared stats. I'm looking at where um, current employers are with their employees. You know, you have a lot of guys that stick around for five or plus years. Um, and then they're, they're kind of the core audience, but then you'll get some younger guys that'll come right out of college and either they'll, they'll stick around with a company that they're, they're feeling secure with, uh, and they're happy with, and then they, they don't really move anywhere else or, or seek out other employment options, especially right now in 2020. Um, a lot of, a lot of folks are able to adapt and work remotely, but now they, they're kind of stuck in their operational view. So being able as an employer, I think, to, to announce to the workforce as a whole, we're not just a chicken company. You know, we're not just this, I think is, is the number one concern. Because as soon as I go talk to an intermediate, uh, you know, a staffing agency or something like that, you start losing that connection with your empl employees right away. Actually, you brought up a, uh, something I was, I've been thinking about. So, you know, there, we've been talking about the sort of the technical requirements of cybersecurity, but there's an entire ecosystem around the technicians that also, I, I think, has, a, has, a, has an image or a, a marketing issue, and that's the auditors. It, it's, the, it's the project managers. It's the folks that actually can speak cyber from a business operations and risk point of view. Um, and, you know, I, I certainly you all know the NIST NICE framework and that does go beyond just the technical positions. How difficult is it, Kyle, um, for you to hire not only the IT and OT folks, so that's, that's one, one problem set, then also that, that ecosystem that surrounds the, the technicians. You know, I think for us, you know, the, the, the greatest challenge is, is the more specialty that you require. So if you're looking for the, the journalist or the project manager, you know, fields or professions that can translate into, you know, you could be a project manager at a company that's focused in IT or one that's focused in, you know, uh, delivering security and, and the, the methodologies can be very similar. But when we look into very unique specialties, for example, uh, IoT, there's, we have people that specialize in keeping the plants up and running. They know the technology, but they don't have the security background. And we'll have the security background, but we don't have necessarily the OT background of the, the Rockwell or Sim Siemens or industrial control systems, PLC, SCADA, et cetera. So what we're doing to try to tackle some of those challenges is, is bringing those together, those groups together. And for me, as, as kind of Adam was saying is, you know, you don't have to go to Google or to a Microsoft to get some of this experience. We have it right here. We need those individuals. And the great thing about a company like Purdue is you get those opportunities to do a lot of things, to wear a lot of hats. So if you can come in as a security analyst. And if you have an interest in the OT, IoT space, my goal is because of the talent shortage, we're going to continue to develop you, whether it's through role rotations, getting exposures through that, partnering with a more senior person within the organization, sending you to the SANS training or industry specific training for that for that niche and say, hey, you're going to grow it organically because I don't think I'm going to be able to pull the talent specifically. You know, here we are as a, a company that's based in a more rural area. We're not in a major metropolitan area. Given the, the COVID concern, uh, people traveling or hiring or coming in and relocating is, is very limited. And so remote workforce opens up an opportunity. It also limits our, our ability to hire people as well. So we're having to try to do this organically. I think that's one of the approaches. It's not the only approach, but building that internally. And so the traditional roles, to your point, I, I think have been less of a concern. We can find applicants that have that experience when you get into a cloud security architect or OT with security experience. And as you say, hey, we need five or 10 years experience. You're just, it's just going to be non-existent. It's going to be so, they're going to be going to the Google or Microsoft and that talent point, talent pool becomes even harder with the unfilled jobs out there. I want one follow on, then I'll move to Andrew and Adam. So have you found that your initiative to grow your own, uh, to promote within, to provide the education and the opportunity for that growth, has that been have you seen an increase in your retention rates? Yes, I think, and, that, and that's, that's, it's not a guarantee. You, there's, I, at, what I say is that there's a point where you invest, 
that they become the individuals become more desirable outside the organization as well. So as they're getting that training, they're getting their experience, we're looking to say, what are the things that we can do to retain talent? It's not just compensation, it's opportunity. It's some, some individuals want to be able to be on more and more projects and get learning versus compensation. Maybe it's the continued training, but yes, absolutely. The more we build it organically, they become, they're get, trying to be po poached by not just competitors, by other opportunities, the bigger shops and say, hey, come to us now that you've already uh, learned all of this. So it, it goes both ways, but it is a concern that there's a tipping point where it's, we, we almost can't keep them anymore. And it just depends on the individual's personal needs and desires. Thank you. So Andrew, I'm gonna ask you this question. Um, I had worked at a university in the past, University of Maryland, Baltimore County, um, long, too long ago, probably 10 years ago. Um, and you know, it was really where the emergence was primarily through one of my main clients who was involved in critical infrastructure. They said to me, Christina, we can't fill enough ICS security roles. And so there was this, you know, pulled together a number of working groups saying, how do we get IT and engineering together to come up with an ICS security curriculum? And at that time, I mean, it's, it's difficult, I think, sometimes for academia to, to, to forecast, to see what the demand is, you know, five, 10 years ahead of their time. How is Purdue integrating or managing that intersection between IT and engineering, uh, either through the OAT Center or through other initiatives to start graduating more folks that have this ICS, SCADA, and OT experience? Yeah, so I mean, focused in, uh, maybe it's just a two-part answer, focused in on OATS, uh, which is our research group, you know, we're sort of specializing in pulling, you know, technical background students, so ECE type folks or um, um, uh, our tech school of technology, we have a little bit of ag engineering, and then we sort of push them to, to learn the, the other side. So if you're an ECE, you're going to do a lot of ag specific research and we focus on the pipeline a lot, right? So mm -hmm. we're, we're looking a lot about uh, moving data from the sensor to the cloud or wherever its processing system is and sort of security is inherent in that. And we have a, um, a really big security research center on at Purdue's campus that we, that we work with as well. And so there's a little bit of like practical education going on in the graduate school, you know, within OATS and with those students. At a broader level, the university is working on building um, like almost little little badges to your degree. Uh, so right now we have one that's uh, for, uh, related to data science, where you can sort of attach it to any degree as long it's 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 a little bit different than a minor, um, but it's there there are courses that are designed to give you breadth and not necessarily depth in some of these areas. And what we found was that there are a lot of students who didn't quite know what data science was took went into this program and they're usually uh, combined what we call living communities, living learning communities. So it's a group of students, a cohort of students that live together, they work together, they take all these classes that come from different backgrounds and so they can learn from each other. And we find that a lot of students switch their major after doing it, that they didn't understand what it meant. And now that they, they get to play with it a little bit without going too deep where they get scared of it, they go, well, that's really interesting. And then they're willing to dive in and learn it better. Um, and so we're starting to do that with other programs too. Uh, security for certainly is uh, a big one. And we teach it well on the graduate side, but not so well on the undergraduate side. And you're right, it's really hard uh, for the university to predict where to go. And, uh, well, you, and you know, uh, from your experience, the university that, you know, doesn't have one mass that ever leader that everyone follows. It's kind of a tug of war of a group of people that yeah. are largely uh, sort of independent and, and, you know, don't really have a reporting structure or a person to report to. And so it's really hard sometimes to steer that. And the clearest way to steer it is outside uh, uh, entities, businesses and funding agencies coming in saying, hey, we see this need, we need you to do that. Um, you know, that's really Im impactful, right? You know, for example, OATS is entirely industry funded. Every, all of our, our funding, it comes from uh, companies that have joined the center and by joining, they get to, to help uh, push what we're working on mm -hmm. and change the direction. And that's directly gone back to a program we do in the summer now called REEU, where we focus on ag engineering and technology, the merging of them, data security, data processing, that types of stuff, it all came from industry uh, support and then national funding. But it was the industry that came and said, hey, we need students to do this. Uh, that really uh, set up that uh, sort of, you know, set of dominoes that allowed the money to come in to, to build these programs out. So 
you know, it, it's a marketing thing. It's, it's getting into the university. It's also being very vocal with the university about what do we need and uh, help uh, identify, like, what are those specialty programs that, that we need students to come out with? Yeah. Very interesting. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump to Adam. So point three um, really is uh, a, a, a unique company. Um, I would say that you're at the, you are really um, a facilitator between industry requirements, um, education, and then the ability to assess um, individuals for, for careers in cybersecurity. Um, so from your perspective and from the world that you, that you live in every day, um, can you talk to us a bit about the importance of what you're doing and, and the impact that it's going to have on the future of workforce development issues? Sure. Uh, so I think to, to kind of piggyback on some of what Andrew and, and both Kyle had brought to light, um, how we've been working with customers, and, and it sounds like we have a, um, a very similar situation with Kyle too, is we've been sitting down uh, with large organizations and saying, you know, we can, we can have um, professionals that have all of these certificates, all the kinds of credentialings. They can come from the best universities in the whole world. Uh, at the end of the day, they have to be able to still do the job, but also do the job um, the way that the employee, the, the employer needs it. Um, and so, like, like I said, with uh, the, the cyber terrain changing every time the customer and the industry changes, I think um, our ability at, at point three to sit down with companies and be able to identify what their needs are exactly. What are their training requirements for each of their teams? Uh, do they have a training department? Do they have just a, an intern that keeps track of everybody's certifications and, and runs with that in a spreadsheet? Or do you have a dedicated staff that, that understands what are the capabilities of the employees? What we've been doing is sitting down with those types of organizations and basically fusing our curriculum to their needs. Uh, we, we make all kinds of great uh, modules that are great for anybody in InfoSec, uh, from someone who just is learning to pick apart uh, binaries to someone who opened up Wireshark by accident once. Those little things where you can have someone from the SOC um, or someone from even outside of security um, come in to escalate and still follow an organization's standards and say, you know, these are all of the problems that are faced in your company right now. Uh, and we have them in escalate and they're being simulated for you. And if you can't address those problems right now, here are some preliminary challenges that get your feet wet and all of those types of things. So um, we've had a lot of fun with uh, presenting those types of challenges to, to folks. Um, we try not to directly teach lessons or um, go ahead and, and give out long lectures or slideshows. I think that's best for the universities for, for that kind of stuff. Uh, when it comes to Escalate, we want to make sure that our people are applying those skills and learning, um, you know, if they do have a methodology, um, maybe it's time to adapt because their employer finds those needs and we're the ones that kind of replicate those things. Uh, when it comes to talent screening, uh, it's been really, really crazy for us the past year. Um, I've basically been, been a mad scientist for, uh, for point three now with all types of different employers. We had government contractors, we had small private firms. Um, we had a large, large company that was anonymously just sending us users and we were using Escalate um, to set a standard where we said, all right, we've identified um, your training curriculum that you would need if you wanted to grow your workforce using uh, our platform Escalate. Let's turn the table around. We're gonna use those same learning objectives and use those on your job requirements. So what do you wanna actually screen for? Uh, and then myself, the rest of my team, uh, we sit down with the training teams, we sit down with the HR, the program managers, uh, and we say, you know, this is what Escalate is gonna test for. You come in, um, you can bring in 100, you can bring in 1,000, you can bring in 10,000 candidates. Um, they can come from any and all walks of life. And, and we've seen uh, the demographics over the years for uh, women in security being uh, kind of misrepresentative. So we wanted to be able to take all of that ambiguity out of the way and, and be as objective as possible. Can you actually do the tasks that your employer needs? Uh, and so we've been basically customizing uh, entrance exams and, and using Escalate as a filter um, for that and hiring process. 
do you want to um, have your HR find your top guys, your top candidates, uh, but you have a hard decision? Well, we can make a test where we can tell you, you know, with some really good evidence or just use the, uh, the challenges that we have since they simulate the actual scenarios, use those challenges as a prompt. Uh, instead of having a panel of your, your project managers and your technical leads shooting questions at them, actually give them a scenario and, and have them write down what they think, what their methodologies are, show their source code. Uh, so we're, we're really trying to connect the dots from the, the employers. Here are the problems that we see as a whole, generally um, as an employer, and we're trying to fill these gaps. We replicate those issues and then we become that, that filter. Um, no one can get through the other side until you can demonstrate this. Um, and, and we've actually tested it a few, few times in, in a fun couple of ways. Uh, we had some really, really overqualified guys. We had people with little to no experience and, and see what happens on the other side. And, and a lot of times um, we've had folks that couldn't complete the challenges. Um, they just, they didn't have the experience. They didn't have the knowledge, but they had um, the motivation and the drive. And you can see on paper that these guys were really working to finish this challenge. And so maybe they didn't hit the mark 100%, but your technical guys um, and your hiring managers get an even closer diagnosis of what is out there in the market right now. You know, if your HR is saying, here are 100 guys that we think are right, they come through our side of the filter and you're saying, well, we're, we're still not getting our guys. What's actually out there? What, what kind of talent is available? So we're really trying to help it from all sides. And it's been really exciting to see the results. That's wonderful. There are two questions. Um, that I wanna cover before we leave. Um, this question from uh, Ewing is specific to uh, Maryland Ag Education, um, but it really goes back to how do we influence K through 12 um, to really take on careers in STEM? Um, you know, it's been discussed ad nauseum, but there really hasn't been a silver bullet um, that, that I've seen. Um, so just a quick question, have, have you, have any of you or all of you have thinking about how, how we can reach down to K through 12 to ensure that those students who are looking for careers in, in, um, or direction, um, have an understanding of what's out there, um, for programming, for access to companies, et cetera. Is there, is there a silver bullet or, or is it just um, too difficult? Do I see you, you, you brought your, you, you wanna to add to that based upon your question? So <clears throat> I bring this up because I've done some recruiting. I'm a graduate at College Park and done some recruiting over the years. And one of the things we've learned is if you wait until someone's ready to graduate from high school, you're too late. You need to start middle school to really have an influence on young people. I come from an education family. My mother and my sister both retired teachers. So, and, and you know, both of my kids are coming back and having an influence on the farm. They're both, you know, out of school. <clears throat> and um, their experience in school was very poor as far as any inclination that you want to be part of agriculture. That was like the last thing they would tell anybody to get involved in. So I think there's a lot of work to be done in the ag community. And I think these types of um, events really bring to the forefront with a lot of people to how important ag is and what the opportunities are. Most employers that are ag companies, and I'm sure they'll tell you, they, they get most of their employees outside of ag because there's not enough ag kids that get into ag. Yeah. They're out there trying to find greener pastures on the other side of the fence. And if they would have had a little more guidance when they were younger, um, that experience that they have, my daughter's a CPA at Ernst & Young. I mean, she's invaluable for the ag community someday in the future. But I'm trying to attract ag businesses to Maryland. And, you know, I've talked to big, big venture people and it's hard to pull them in. Mm hmm they don't view ag as the premier investment venue. So there's a lot of work to be done. Yeah, I think there is. Oh, go ahead. 
I was just say I, my, my experience is a little bit different only because I'm a I'm at a, a leading ag school. <laughs> and so, you know, the few people that do choose to go to ag were one of the places they go. But I agree with you that early educate or that early engagement is really important. We do a lot of extension things, but from my personal experience, the reason I got into first in or, uh, engineering is because of first robotics, because I had that experience of building. Now I didn't get into robotics, but it's where I really discovered, Hey, I like this, like building a thing and programming and making it happen. Um, so I don't know if there's a silver bullet to answer the original question. I think it's like a slew of, of, you know, I don't know what the right metal is, but something not as valuable as silver, but I think it's all around experiences. It's really, you gotta get the students out of the classroom for a little while, get them into doing something related to it. It doesn't have to be exactly the job, but kind of pique their interest and, and, and spread that sort of, you know, their, their view of how big can this be or what the opportunities are here. Then when they get to the university, they can choose a little bit better what program they will go into. I see far too many people come to the university, spend their first two years just trying to figure out what the heck they want to learn. And, you know, for better or for worse, when you go to a university, we hit you, right? I mean, you went to high school, class was hard, tests were hard, you went to university, and it's way harder, right? And if you're not really excited about what you're doing, it's really easy to get down on it. And you see a lot of students get stuck in this trap where they, you know, they, they know that feel the program they're in there isn't the one for them. It's a ton of work to switch. They don't know where to go. And, and, and you leave with a degree that you don't really, aren't really excited about and you don't have a lot of interest moving forward. But like you're saying, if you just had a slightly different perspective, you would see, oh, there's really a huge opportunity here. And I can actually do something that's interesting to me. But, but, but you know, like you said, if you're in high school, senior year, or freshman in college, it's probably too late, you know, to, to really, to really uh, make an impact. Um, do I have something? Yeah, just as a side note is I'm actually an adjunct professor as well. And I teach cybersecurity for the Purdue Business School with an E, not the U. So you know, there's a lot of Purdue going on here between the university, the company, and then also Salisbury University, which has the Purdue Business School. And I teach cybersecurity as a 400 level class there. And really, it's one of the limited um probably classes that really exposes them to the cyber aspect and really the demand for jobs and is a way for me to help bring awareness of the opportunities that you don't need to go to, you know, a Google or a Microsoft to get a security job. It's, it's right here down the street from you. And, and, and I look at it as an, an, an outreach in developing those um, students. And in some case we recruit them, we have internships. I'll share uh, to the point about high school, uh, several years ago when I was working in Richmond, I would go to the technical high, high school there and they would have career fairs essentially for the students of potential careers when you leave, um, where do you wanna go? And I would say that, you know, as I would have the booth to say, here's jobs in cybersecurity, I would, we would have a, students come to our table and learn more about what we do, but we definitely got overshadowed by the FBI and the, the, the healthcare and the doctors and the nurses and, and the engineering. And so it's a little bit of a marketing aspect as well is that students aren't exposed to it. They don't understand cyber. It's, it's so uh, ethereal. It's, it's, it's out there and maybe see something in a movie and it's gotten a lot better. 20 years when I was 20 years ago, when I got into this, cyber wasn't a word that was used. I mean, you might have said computer security or network security, but the role didn't exist. There were no degrees in it at the time. And so I know we've come a long way. We still have a long ways to go. And how do we get further down into the education system to say, this is a real career path. And I know that it's competing with other roles, but this is one where there are so many jobs that aren't being fulfilled right now. This is a deficit um, in terms of, of people qualified to even apply for these jobs and we're competing for this talent that doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. And how do we get there? It, it means it starts sooner. So then when they come to college, they're actually looking for it other than what I see. I said, if you finish college and you don't know what you wanna do, I can assure you, you know what you don't wanna do. So after, you know, that's, that's what happens. You figure out what you don't want to do in college if you don't know what you plan to do. Fortunately for me, I was computer science and then I got into cybersecurity and the rest was history. And I'm just trying to open that door to get as many students that never had exposure say, hey, I never thought about a job in cybersecurity and now they've gone off and, and purposely pursued cyber jobs. And I know I'm doing my part to help fill that gap. That's great. Well, we're coming up on 1245. Um, love to see if there's a couple more questions that we can have answered. Um, one just popped up from Tamar. 
Um, as for, for someone who works in economic development, they hear a lot of frustration from businesses about the disconnect between higher ed and employer needs. We hear that the curricula are too academic and insufficiently agile. I've begun to wonder if we are going to move from almost a trade school model with apprenticeships. Um, I, can, I can certainly uh, respond from a state of Maryland point of view. There has been a number of apprenticeship programs that um, uh, that the Department of Labor Licensing and Regulation and Workforce Development Agencies have been trying to work with the National Science Foundation on creating a cyber apprenticeship program, whereby it, there will be an intersection between um, employers, academia, and um, really where, where the metal hits the road, where, what is needed in terms of that skill set and give practical experience on the job. Um, so Dollar, uh, National Science Foundation and the Workforce Development Agencies are, are definitely been working on that, that initiative. But love to hear from all of you as well. So, so I, you know, for better or worse is what I think of a university. I think undergraduates uh, job is to teach you how to think about something. The graduate is to teach you teach you how to think about something that no one's thought about before. And business, the industry, is to train you in your area. Maybe that doesn't align with everyone's view, but I would think from I think from the university side, that's what faculty view it as, right? And uh, so it's true we're not really a training program. We use the the an area, say electrical engineering or ag engineering, whatever, to sort of set the backdrop to teach you to think about problems in that type of area, but not really prepare you for technology today. By the time you leave graduate school, you're still like a generation behind in tech, right? Mm -hmm. uh, often often in, in knowledge. So what Purdue has done is to try to balance that. And I think this is a really great program that we have a thing called a co-op. So you can do your degree in five years instead of four, but you spend a third or more of every year working in a company as an employee from, from freshman year all the way to senior year. Typically, you are in the same company all four years, unless you're not a, unless you decide that's not the right industry, right? But usually, once you kind of find an area you like, you go back. And now, by the time you've graduated, it took you five instead of four years, but you got paid a little on the way, so you have a little less debt, which is good, and you're trained somewhat, right? You have about two years almost of, of practical on-the-job training. And what we find is a lot of these co-ops they treat the first year or two as more of like an internship, it's like throw them a little thing and get them get them used to, uh, you know some little project nobody wants to do they kind of uh, get some experience but by the end they're like in a team they're helping do something they're actually participating actively it's like something like 60 percent of those people end up taking job offers from the company they work with because they, they can just start working right away and it's but the really interesting thing is it's also a really large number of kodos that's what we call when we moved at majors for, for co-op students so again it's another one of those things where it's like they don't really know what they want to do the practical experience helped them figure out or learn about new areas and industries and they moved early enough in their program that they were actually able to have success by the time they were done. So I think you can find a balance where you're almost, you know, a trade school, but you're letting industry do that part by incorporating them into the academic uh, side of that, of that um, program. Hey, you bring up a subject that there's, you know, not a lot of college universities actually have the co-op program, um, but it seems as though those that do have a tremendous placement rate um, and have graduates that are very uh, focused on, on a particular career, knowing that they've had the practical experience and can move forward. Um, I have one more question. Someone mentioned, I think we need to take more time in our outreach to young people in the middle of the high school to explain what someone in cybersecurity actually does. Um, and to better relate the pragmatic part of the actual job function. There, you know, I, I would absolutely agree, and I'm sure that I, I see Kyle and Adam and Andrew nodding as well. Um, there are programs that have started in the state of Maryland, one called Life Journey, whereby there's um, uh, the ability to have high school students actually enter into a virtual job along with a mentor. Um, and they can experience what that looks like. But again, it's not massive in scale. It's not every, every, every school. It's not reaching down to the middle schools. Um, so I would say that that is something that um, we need to work on as a community. Um, absolutely. And um, something that I definitely want to volunteer and help with. 
Um, well, I guess it's, it's 1250. Um, I wanna thank everyone for, for joining us today. Kyle, Andrew, Adam, thanks for your time. Um, for, the, for the attendees, um, we do have an attendee list. So if you wanna get in touch with anyone that you've spoken to or may align with in terms of their questions that have been posed, please reach out. Again, we want this to be the first of many discussions around cyber and ag. Um, we hope that problem sets will be generated out of this discussion <laughs> and that further further conferences will be held and um, we'll start to, to nip away at all of these issues that we've brought up uh, over the past two days. So thank you all. Have a wonderful rest of your afternoon and uh, stay safe around the holidays. Thank you. Likewise. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Bye.